In effect, man, I want to give a big shout out to man, the big homie Eric Hicks, man. Shout out to the first three crew, our city. Man, this brother right here, I was able to get a moment of his time. Very busy brother, man. This brother had life without parole. I'm going to let him talk about that. Uh, he's done a lot of good things. I admire his intellect and his knowledge and his grasp of American Jewish prudence. You know what I mean? So without man too much, man, uh, you know, shout out to you, Big E, man. Uh, introduce yourself to the people who may not know you, though, you know, as you want to be introduced. Hey, well, listen, your, your, your introduction was actually above average. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Eric Hicks. You know, I'm, man, born and raised in the city, you know, Came in with a life sentence when I was 22. Actually had two life sentences. Uh, we was able to, you know, get our life sentences overturned. Well, not overturned, but we got our sentences uh, uh, reduced after 30 years. And, uh, you know, I'm here now, man. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do my part. I mean, you know, just for me to you, I think that's amazing, man. You know, not necessarily what you had to do to go to prison, but what you had to do to get out of prison. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But uh, let me uh, let me just take you back real quick. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, uh, what was life like for you coming up in D.C.? Well, I always say, you know, like D.C., D.C. a unique place, man, because, you know, because of where we situated. You know, and, and, and you kind of learn that as you travel, because we don't uh, we don't really fit into like a demographic of like um, of like. You know how people, you know, when you when you in and people say, oh, you know, you're from the East Coast, but D.C., we don't really fit East Coast. And then we're not really 100 percent South. We just like our own entity. You know what I'm saying? So because we have so many of, of, of you know, we, we we just have our own vibe, period. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of that come from, you know, just like how we was raised, you know, uh, you know, me, I'm born and raised in, in, in Northwest, but, you know, we be all over, you know, uh, Bloomingdale, uh, I always trip out, you know, when I learned during our appeal that Bloomingdale was the poorest neighborhood in D.C. in the 70s, man, in the 80s. I never knew that. You need. Yeah. So, um, you know, just, man, childhood was a childhood, you know, you know, we, man, we ripping around through the alleys, man, uh, we played 33, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, when we was kids, we had our little on and off beats with Leroy Pop, you know, that's, you know, just typical kid shit, man. You know? I kind of want to ask, uh, let's say uh, for people who don't understand the game, quote unquote, right? Let's, mm. you know, let me just for the, just, you know, just to build a foundation of, you know, how the uh, the government takes, uh, let's say, our lifestyle of survival or hustling mm -hmm. and this and that and makes it into all these organized crime things. So, you know, what was your lifestyle like, you know, once you would start running the streets in comparison to, you know, what we would say the government said later, but, you know, what was the true lifestyle, you know, for a guy in the streets at that time? Um, You know, for us, um, <clears throat> We was like the youngest in the neighborhood, you know. You had a, uh, you know, uh, uh, around First Street, you know, in, in the eighties. You know, you had, you know, the older dudes. They, um, you know, they they had their own thing. So, you know, the younger dudes, you know, when we came along, uh, you know, me, Tone, Ronald, uh, Danny, you know, Domi came later, you know, but we was like, you know, we 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 had our own little thing. Like we, you know, the, uh, the older dudes after a while. Um, they grew to respect us because they, you know, they said, man, you know, these little, these, these little dudes is hungry, man. And, um, you know, just in DC back then, you know, like speaking from, uh, you know, today's perspective, you know, you don't want to glorify, but you know, the eighties and nineties were a time where, you know, it was like young guys, you know, we was hungry. So, you know, you wanted to, you wanted to hang outside, you know, like, hey man, y'all, y'all want the black hole? I ain't going. I'm gonna stay around here and, and catch this money. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, uh, but but you know, through all of that though, <clears throat> you know, through the hustling and everything, we always stuck together because we was we was tight even before drugs. So, you know, so when you throw, you know, money in the occasion, I mean, you know, back then you you talking about 
87, 88, 89, you know, guys standing out there and, and you coming in the house, man, with fucking 10, 15, and 20,000 dollars that you done made. And, you know, that's just that's what the city was like back then. A lot of people don't know that that uh me and Tony actually had really beat fair cases before we even caught this case. Because uh I came in in the summer of 90. I caught my first fair case then. Uh I was one of the fortunate ones that I went to trial and I got acquitted of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, and this to go to show you how diabolical the phase is, is that, uh, they, they arrested me in August of 90. So they also wanted to arrest Tom, but they said, ah, oh, we can't grab him just yet because he was still a juvenile. So, so they waited for a couple weeks and then, and, and then they, and then they raided his grandmother's house. Right. But they were so thirsty for a conviction that the shit fell through the cracks. And and so when they raided the house, uh, and they found like some residue, a whole a whole bunch of bullshit. So now right after uh right after I got acquitted, they had to they had to offer him in Faye, in Faye court, they had to offer him a cop to like a year because they fucked up. So so you know, so so both of us wound up getting out. But but the thing is, is this though, but when we both got out, uh when I came home, I came home in uh, February of 91. And and then I went right back in in in, in May of, of 91 for murder, right? Uh I jumped the moon again. I got back out. Uh when and Tone came home like September of 91, and then he went back in in like January of 92 for murder. So, but by that time, the wheels was already turning. So and and so we had an idea that. They were coming for us, you know. Even even the lawyers, uh, the lawyers told us back then, like, look, this is not just a simple murder investigation. They want something more. So you know, the lawyers was pretty open with it. So we knew, but you know, but when you you know when when you young, you don't really you don't you. I'm not gonna say you don't appreciate it, but you know, but you feel you can run through a wall. You got two youngins who just beat the feds. You can't tell us nothing at this time. We think we can beat anything, you know. So, so in, in that regard, we kind of knew that they were coming. And then when Tone came home in 92, uh, uh, the end of the summer of 92, it was clear that, 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 that they was trying to bake us a cake. And, uh, and so, so, you know, we, so we saw the signs, whereas other people, they may not see the signs. You know, we saw them. Uh, we just, I'm not going to say we didn't care, but, you know, but we just felt, man, that, you know, whatever they were going to do, they were going to do, but we were going to live our life.